Hello and welcome to Hardy Party of Five and a Half. How are you doing, Rebecca? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm sure you're excited about today. Yeah, my little history nerd heart is pitter pattering right now. Yes, bring me the makeup artist anytime, but bring you the historian, That's and right. hey, it's a whole new ballgame. Oh yeah. <laughs> This is one of our most popular segments called This Month in History. Mm -hmm. We usually kind of do a game show where I try to stump you and... Try to stump me. Okay. (laughs) That's cute. It's hard to do. Oh, really? So, um, (laughs) but this month, we're getting... We're getting... We got the big dog. Oh, yeah. We're getting educated this week. That's right. We have one of the leading Lincoln scholars in America on today. His name is Harold Holzer. He is like authored, co-authored, or edited more than like 52 books. Yeah. He's contributed to like over 500 articles, written forwards to books, chapters in books. He's really kind of amazing. Yeah, And he is a Lincoln scholar. And just being around him on the computer, I feel smarter. Do you? Don't you? No. No, okay. But the, you just retain this stuff. Like I don't retain it. I just it's just for some reason this history can come into your brain and it sticks there. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't can't think of what topic comes into my brain and it sticks. I don't know. I have to think about I think that. you do that with scheduling. <laughs> Maybe so. Scheduling sticks in your brain and random unknown and useless facts stick <laughs> yes. in my brain. I mean, you everybody should have you on their team for trivia pursuit. Mm. That but puts a lot of pressure on me now. Not for cards because you don't think logically and you can't remember like oh, what's I get been bored played. In cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you probably get bored with history, I get bored with cards. Right. That's that's so interesting. We make a good pair. I know. You complete me. <laughs> okay. You had me at hello. <laughs> okay. so Anyways. We saw Harold on the recent, there was a recent documentary. Yeah. Three-part documentary on History Channel. On History Channel. About Abraham Lincoln, and it was yeah. titled Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, and we just love that show. They yes. did Grant too last year. They did year. Grant, and we thought it was so good yeah. because it's not. Here's why I like it for not for you non-history you like people. Yeah, you're gonna have the heralds that are gonna pop in and give you all this background and juicy information, but then there's a dramatization, and that's what you're there for. If you're not a history person, it brings it. It just brings it all together. So you want to see the dramatization because that's how you remember. Yeah. Well, that's how I remember. Well, it's like you a movie can... and a documentary. At the it's same all time. the same thing. Mm. Right. It's so cool because they'll have like a picture and then they'll zoom in on the picture and it comes to life. Like they pose the characters in that picture. Yeah. And then all of a sudden like, they play out that scene they were just talking about. Yes. And that's yeah. what makes it real to me. That's what helps me remember it. So you not non-history people. Go watch that because it'll help you. You watch that. And this is our episode is going to help you even more. Even more. It's really fascinating. Yep. I can't wait to talk Lincoln. Here we go. Let's do it. Harold Halzer. Harold Halzer, thank you so much for joining us on Hardy Party of Five and a Half. You are an Abraham Lincoln scholar. You, the reason we heard about you was from the History Channel. We watched Abraham Lincoln on the History Channel and were fascinated by it. And we want to know what, what about Abraham Lincoln fascinates you? How did you first dive into him? So um, I was in fifth grade in an outer borough, New York City public school. It was about, I guess about 1960. So it's more than 60 years ago. And our teacher actually brought in a hat filled with the folded up names of you know, what she considered to be American heroes. I think all white, all men. And we were each asked to pick a name out and then go up to the library and find a book about that person and then write a report, you know, a composition. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what was guiding my hand, but I picked Lincoln. (laughs) Now, and then I did a report on a book that I that I liked and still like. Um, It was also the moment of the Civil War centennial. In a battle recreations, um, controversies, reenactments. And so, you know, uh, young kids were sort of 
all excited about that, collecting the stamps and doing all sorts of silly, but, but things that get you involved. So yeah. I just never, never looked back from that moment, whether yeah, so it was magazines or TV experiences or books. And that's how it started. So it never waved from fifth grade on. We we're just all in. There was never a time that you're like going. In a no, different- I was writing a book when I was 15. I mean, <laughs> wow. I didn't publish it, but I was pretending I was, I was getting it. Ready to get public <laughs> that's so cool. Does that book exist anywhere or is that just? Funny you should ask. It exists in my basement. Oh, really? <laughs> and I just, I just donated my papers, quote unquote, you know, my files. Yeah. To the New York State Library in Albany. Preparatory to, I guess, selling our house, which would be a good thing for us to do. <laughs> um, and there it was. I didn't donate it to the papers because, you know, it's a, a teenage project. Yeah. So I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I know just where it is. Unlike most things in my house. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's four volumes of oh. typed, you know, with a manual typewriter. Yeah. Cut out photographs from magazines and books. I might even read it someday. Yeah. It. <laughs> it's funny when you read your old stuff, you're going, what was I thinking? Because when you're that young, you're like, and you think it was the most important thing ever when you mm-hmm. wrote it, but... <laughs> You know what was important to me? That it's like four volumes of scrapbook, you know. And um, what was important to me was to finish it. So I worked very hard on it. You know, other kids were doing other more teenage things. I was sitting in our basement uh, where my bedroom was writing my book. It explains a lot of my problems. <laughs> This sounds like me because like around that same age, I got into Thomas Jefferson and for years I studied about him and I was kind of that kid too. So mm-hmm. you drew all the presidents at, I one, did, point. at one point. Yeah, he's very artistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you drew them. That's interesting. Yeah. I went through and drew all the presidents. So I don't know. It was a misspent <laughs> summer, I guess. I don't know. If you can, if you can tell the difference between John Tyler and William Henry Harrison, you're a better man than I am. <laughs> They're pretty. That's a hard distinction. Well, that whole section of presidents is kind of generic to me. I never got <laughs> yeah. into that. The 1840s there, I'm like, who are these guys? <laughs> it yeah. is generic. And then the 1880s becomes bearded guys. So that's, <laughs> yeah. that's generic to 70s and 80s. You had to have anyway. a beard to be president. So, so <laughs> with, with Lincoln, he kind of embodies the American dream because he came out of nowhere. So can you give us a quick like synopsis of his, where he came from and how he ended up being who he was. Yeah, I mean, it is really an amazing story because not only is he living the American dream, he's, he will later become kind of the poet almost, prose poetry to be sure. But in his reflections, in his seeking of opportunity for all people extending the American dream, you know, as he said, giving all an equal chance in the race of life government of by and for the people, he's articulating the promise of the American dream. And he's in a great position to do it because he's lived it. He, uh, you know, I've been to all of his early cabins, you know, even though most of them are recreations, but they are, first of all, in the middle of nowhere. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to the rural areas, but it was hard to get there. Yeah, <laughs> And it is nothing, there is nothing around those areas even today. Hmm. And he said it was primitive, wild, um, uncharted territory, you know, wild animals, unyielding trees and roots and grubs, he wrote. I'm just back from Indiana. Um, I was at Purdue for a couple of days for a C-SPAN event. And um, you know, Indiana's pretty proud of its Lincoln Association, although it doesn't, I kept telling them, you don't market it as well as Kentucky and Illinois. You should do more. So it made me look back at the Indiana years. And, you know, Lincoln, his mother died, his sister died in childbirth. Uh, his father struggled. He had very little education. Itinerant teachers who didn't know much, very little continual schooling. Books were very rare. Until it's, and they were non existent until the stepmother arrived, and then they were rare. 
Mm -hmm. Out of that, build, not only does he build a life and a triumphant life, but sets an example for people. So the, uh, he came from nothing and became everything. That's the easiest way to do it. Hmm. So didn't his dad leave for months to go find a wife? Isn't that how that happened? Yes. Yeah. Today, a good neighbor would report his father to child for oh, yeah. protective services. Because yeah. he left a young boy and girl. She, he was about nine. She was about 10 or 11. Uh -huh. And he was gone for months because he had to go find another wife. You know, it's, I guess it's romantic in a weird kind of way. Because he knew yeah. this. He, he'd known her before and liked her. But it was also for survival. A farmer couldn't survive with a children and no wife. They had specific roles in the farm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess he must have heard, or maybe when he got to Elizabethtown, Kentucky, Thomas heard of uh, Sarah Johnston's widowhood, or Sarah Bush, as he knew her, um, when she was single. But it was not romantic when they met. Father said, um, well, you, you haven't got a husband and I haven't got a wife. We might as well hitch, hitch up. Something really romantic like that. So romantic. Was there. <laughs> wow. And I think she said, well, I owe money and I can't leave the town until I pay. So um, he paid her debts and off they went. Wow. So when she got back to Indiana, she thought that they were wild animals because they were so filthy and oh, ragged wow. um, and abandoned in, in, in the winter. It was awful. Wow. Oh my goodness. That's great. Wow. So as a mom, I'm always trying to spur my kids on, on academically. How did Sarah Bush Lincoln spur Abraham Lincoln on academically and inspire him? You know, she didn't read much, but she had books. I don't, I don't know quite what that was all about. Maybe they were her late husbands, but she brought literature into this cabin. She also told her husband, who was a carpenter, Build a floor, will you? I mean, I, I'm not living here if the floor is dirt. Uh, and he built a floor, which he was perfectly capable of doing. Um, yeah, she brought the books. She recognized <coughs> something special in him. His father needed, you know, I always tell people who are quick to condemn Lincoln, uh, Thomas Lincoln, in fairness, because he wanted Abe to work. On the farm. In fairness, farmers of the day tried to have a lot of children. And one of the reasons, I mean, I guess there's an absence of birth control, but also because they needed the girls to make butter and milk and clean and all that. And they needed the boys to help the father. It was just the way that society was. Mm -hmm. well, um, Lincoln's only had three children, and one of them died in infancy. So they had a boy and a girl, and the boy happened to grow up to be a big guy and a very strong kid. So I don't really blame the father who, for not saying, oh, my boy is going to be a great man. I should let him read while I do all the work. Yeah, uh, He wasn't a lazy man, but it was a lot of work. It was backbreaking, time mm. consuming. So he wanted his son to help him in the fields. And Sarah astonishingly saw something in him uh, and, and, and thought he could achieve more than her own children. Yeah. And so I think he had a great relationship with his stepmother. Mm -hmm. He adored her. Um, and he had a rough relationship with his father because not only did he love reading, he disliked manual labor. It's amazing that he became so muscular and strong considering he didn't like to work. So he must have worked. Yeah. Because otherwise he wouldn't have developed the way he did. Yeah. What was his personality like? And aside from his height, how did he, how did he stand apart from other politicians of his time? There was always the humor. I was just reading a, a new article uh, by, I wish I remembered his name, uh, a wonderful article about Lincoln, Lincoln's first tour to New England in 1848 to campaign for Zachary Taylor. Why would he have been useful in Massachusetts? You know, and the answer that this young scholar came up with is because he was kind of a humor attraction. 
Mm. It was almost like a, a, a tent show. Go and see this gawky tall guy who takes off his tie and his coat and rolls up his sleeve when he, when he speaks, unlike our dandy Eastern orators who are so proper and prim mm. and, and who makes people laugh with his stories. And um, that was always Lincoln's, um, uh, well, that's what set him apart. In the early days, he was kind of an angry humorist. I mean, he really, the, the trend or the typical thing was to insult people bitterly. Guess what? We're in that period again, right? Yeah, it's come so, back around, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. He, eased off, he eased off on the really biting satire. It was just very funny. And I think that made him, a, um, it wasn't his voice like with Daniel Webster. He didn't have um, a strong voice that could be heard by 15,000 people very easily. So it was that special attraction that made him um, unique. And also he wasn't a kind of an evangelical orator. He didn't uh, speak in flowery terms or grandiosely, uh, didn't quote anybody. He never quoted, he never, other speakers, if you read the record, would say, as it says in the Bible, a house divided against itself cannot stand. As it says in the Bible, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. As it says in Shakespeare, Lincoln never did. He would just make it part of what he, what he was saying. And if the audience knew it, he assumed they did. Uh, we wouldn't know it today. But, hmm. um, so I think he was quite unique. Yeah. So what what brought him into the limelight? Was it his speaking ability that because he was one of the candidates for president and I read that he really there wasn't much going on. And then suddenly he kind of burst out and became the leading candidate. So, yeah, I mean, he becomes famous. Well, he becomes famous statewide first. Got to have the base on his side. And Lincoln Douglas debates or what really made him famous enough. You know, he, he lost the election, but he won the, the debates by, just by getting through it. It's like Tiger Woods got through the Masters. He didn't win, but he, got, he walked. Yeah. Uh, he walked 72 holes. Lincoln walked 72 holes with Stephen Douglas and mm -hmm. came pretty close to beating him. And suddenly is the major Western anti-slavery voice. Mm -hmm. um, what I think elevated him is that he had a brilliant strategy, which is don't offend anybody, be everybody's second choice. We're mm. not going to win this nomination if the favorite, William H. Seward, gets enough votes on the first ballot, then it's all over anyway. So don't attack Seward. Just say we're here, we're available, we're from the West. And when Seward faltered, Lincoln was just there, he was lurking in third place. Huh. I'm sorry, in second place. And he yeah. ultimately... Uh, uh, Seward just falls, all his delegates abandon him and all the other Western candidates, delegates abandon those guys for Lincoln. And so, yeah, you can say he was a dark horse candidate. The Republicans didn't have as much trouble. Not, this is something that's often forgotten. Why are they more Democratic dark horses than Republican? Because the Democrats, until Roosevelt, required two thirds of the convention to vote for a person. It was so hard. They would go up and down and rise and fall. The Republicans were always just a majority. So there's more chance of getting it done quickly. Um, that's why Douglas wasn't nominated by the Democrats in 1860. And they broke apart because he couldn't get the two thirds. Maybe yeah. Lincoln wouldn't have gotten the two thirds. So he comes off as humble and, you know, he's kind of lowering the bar of expectations, but he's pretty savvy. He knows what he's doing. The whole time. Oh yeah, yeah. And and you know he 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 calls himself humble, but it, everybody who meets him knows that he has a kind of an air of intellectual superiority. Um, people who meet him think they're going to be taking advantage of him, and and find out that he's you know nobody's fool. Very smart guy, and um, you know it's like with politicians I've met. Some of them are very gifted, but some of them, when they enter a room, just, I know the expression now is they use up all the oxygen or they suck up all the oxygen. 
But, you know, Clinton is like that. Um, he walks into a room and just dominates. Everything is just fixed on him. I think Lincoln had that same kind of magic. Part of it was physical because he was so much larger than everybody else. And part of it has to be what we call charisma. Mm, yeah. Mm. So he wins the election in 1860. And then right after that, the South starts seceding. So what was it about his election? What was it about Lincoln being elected that set off the South to just leave the Union so quickly? Well, it's a very good question because he said all through the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the Cooper Union address, um, that he had no intention of interfering with slavery where it existed, reminding people he had no power to interfere with slavery where it existed. Um, the South, all, all he insisted on is that slavery not be allowed to extend beyond those boundaries, that slavery could not be permitted in the West. And the South believed, as Stephen Douglas did, that if you voted to have slavery, you should have it. So why secede? Because Lincoln's election meant that slavery was in a way doomed, because those new Western states would come in opposing slavery, without slavery, and with senators and congressmen who opposed slavery. So therefore, I mean, when would slavery have died in those circumstances? Probably 1900, if they really wanted to keep it going. Um, until the last gasp and last breath. But that was enough of a threat to their empire. And they wanted slavery to go to Cuba, and, you know, maybe um, that the American empire should move southward and embrace new territory. So was it rational that they secede? No. Um, and Lincoln did refuse to say anything after his election to conciliate. He was not gonna say, okay, I won't interfere with slavery. I'll put it in the Constitution. He, he said nothing. And he said, they can read what I've said. I'm not going to say anything to ignite them further. I'm not going to say anything to conciliate them further. You know, he called it, it was a, it was a, a, a practice of silence, masterful inactivity. That's what they call it. <laughs> and that provoked them. So you're right. Um, you know, a month after Election Day, South Carolina, for well, five weeks, South Carolina seceded and opened the floodgates. Yeah. And so he, what a crazy way to enter your presidency. Like he's dealing with it from the very outset. Um, is there any, there's people that say maybe his views on slavery developed over time or did he already know that he wanted to do this or is it just something that developed as his, as his presidency went on to, to eradicate slavery? I definitely believe, A, he was always against slavery. Yeah. What, what he saw of it, which was not much. So s slaves marching past his home when he was a little boy because he lived on the Cumberland Trail. He saw slaves, you know, in Kentucky. Uh, um, and when he traveled to New Orleans as a teenager, he saw a slave market there and was horrified. Um, allegedly said to his cousin, if I ever get a chance to hit this thing, I'll... I'll hit it hard. I'm not sure he really said that, but I don't think he ever believed he had the power to do anything. The mm. Constitution guaranteed the existence of slavery unless there was an amendment to the Constitution. Mm. So he never foresaw a war where he could use military power to you know, abolish slavery or to seize slaves as property, as confiscation. It just happened. But yes, I think what evolved also was not only the circumstance, but also his own view on black people. He didn't know any black people. And if he, the ones he met were generally, you know, the barber in Springfield, Illinois, um, and, and enslaved, enslaved people he met at his friend Josh Speed's plantation in Lexington, where I'm going to visit soon. Um, so, when he gets to Washington, he meets um, Frederick Douglass. He meets yeah. Sojourner Truth. Um, he, he, and he begins to see maybe the pointing the way to a biracial society someday. Did he so and Douglas, I think, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Did he and Douglas get along initially or is that a relationship that kind of developed too? Or I think they got along initially. You know, Douglas comes into the White House um, by invitation, 
and uh, says, um, finds Lincoln seated. He said his legs were wrapped around the leg of the chair. His legs were so long. And he said, um, Mr. Lincoln, I'm Frederick Douglass. And Lincoln says, I know who you are, Mr. Douglass. He stands up to this towering height, invites him to sit down, gets him tea. Just sounds like ordinary politeness. But those kinds of de- polite expressions were not extended to free black people mm. in those days. Um, and Douglas has taken with him. He said, he, no instance did he bring up our difference in color. And he was a Southern man, he said, um, essentially. Uh, they argued a lot. You know, they argued about equal pay for black troops. Lincoln wasn't ready to give equal pay. He said, it'll come, but I can't overwhelm and tax the uh, sensibilities of our soldiers. He didn't know whether they were going to desert just by having black troops in their midst. Hmm. Uh, And so he was very cautious and Douglas prodded him, but then they began working together by 1864, very closely. Hmm. Do you think, did Lincoln ever consider that the South might win the war and how did he keep public opinion on his side? I don't think he ever thought the South would conquer the North. I guess what he worried about is that they would wear, wear, wear out public acceptability of this. I mean, Think of the scandal caused in this country now by the deaths of a few people in Afghanistan when we were withdrawing. I'm not minimizing the losses to their families or to the country, but this is hundreds of thousands of dead people, hundreds of thousands of wounded, property destruction. Lincoln managed to keep alive the idea of saving the Union no matter what the sacrifice, which is a remarkably challenging thing and a remarkable achievement. But we we never tolerate it today. We we would fold today. Um, I'm not saying that critically, just as a matter of fact, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think Lincoln was worried that public opinion could leave. He could lose the election of 64. And then so, it was a, that just keeping America in, in the fight was amazing, keeping the North in the fight. Yeah. And it's amazing that it happened. Mm-hmm. When you can see, if you just look at him when he first got elected and just the three or four years he was in, you could see how he aged. Like he was, there was so much pressure on him. I can't imagine, did he even sleep? I mean, <laughs> how did he? he? He really did. Yeah. His secretaries lived in the office um, in what we call the, the Rose Room. No, it's the, Queen's bedroom now. And um, they would hear him pacing in the big hallway of the private quarters, which I've I've had the privilege of visiting so I can really visualize it. He would just walk back and forth all night, worrying about the troop casualties, worrying about the generals to whom he'd entrusted the strategy and the tactics, usually to his great disappointment until Grant came along. Um, He seldom slept. Um, and he didn't eat well either. He ate not a lot and not often. But he was a big breakfast man. But that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and the aging, the toll that the war and maybe some chronic bad health took on him is pretty alarming. And we tend to forget he had smallpox in 1863. He got it okay. right after the Gettysburg Address. Really? He got it from his son, I have no doubt. And he was in bed. And I think that that's when the photos begin to change, really, after the smallpox episode. Mm. Yeah, he looked so haggard. He looked just worn out. Um, There's been tons of movies made about Lincoln, but recently Steven Spielberg made one, and you were a consultant on that. And it won Oscars, and I think Daniel Day Lewis won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Um, How do you think they did with that? Because there's always, when historical movies are being made, you know, they have to cut corners and all that. So how do you think they did overall in depicting Lincoln? Overall, I thought it was great. And, you know, I was kind of a script consultant, not on set. Yeah. They they didn't want me on set. Or Daniel Day-Lewis didn't want me on set. Too many uh, modern bearded people around. He had Spielberg (laughs) and he had Kushner. He wasn't going to have one more person. That's funny. I think overall, it's a great depiction. Uh, of Lincoln, the, comp- the complexities of Lincoln, the humor, the sorrow, the anger, the passion, the oratorical gift, um, the sense of superiority, the humor. 
Um, the script had a few mistakes in it. They corrected most of them. They didn't correct the big one, which is that, you know, the vote in the House of Representatives was not by delegation, but alphabetical. I still remember the day I got a call from Tony Kushner from Richmond, Virginia saying, Stephen doesn't like your version. <laughs> and I said, it's not my version. It's just, <laughs> Just letting you know, you're mixing it up with a convention. So the movie comes out, a congressman from Connecticut says, we didn't vote three to two. We were unanimous, our congressman. You've insulted the state of Connecticut. We don't want your movie to be distributed to our schools. Spielberg had offered to send it free to every school. And then it was the big deal. Uh, the New York Times wrote about it. Tony Kushner says, I shouldn't have listened to Harold, which was a nice quote, but I think it lost him the best. Screenplay Oscar. Oh, really? You can't make a mistake in a Lincoln and Civil War. There are too many experts out there who are, who are waiting to get you. The best screenplay and best movie award and best director award went to the movie called Argo. I don't know if you remember it. Oh, yeah, with Ben Affleck. With Ben Affleck. But yeah. a really dramatic, intense scene where the hostages leave and go in a plane and the plane has to get down the runway and the Iranians are chasing the plane and the plane just, that never happened either. <laughs> they got through the airport customs and they were sitting in the waiting room and then they left. There was no chase, but nobody, that kind of detail doesn't matter in an ordinary movie. Yeah. The, the Lincoln stuff is watched very carefully, but still, wonderful movie. Uh, I had a lot of opportunities to travel and speak about it and, you know, I got to know Tony Kushner, who's a really brilliant, brilliant guy. And I did meet Daniel Day-Lewis ultimately. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Mr. Hoser, you know, it's funny to hear him speak in an English accent because he plays American so often. Yeah. Mr. Hoser, you've been with me every step of the way. And I said, not that I could know this, but okay. If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> so in that movie, they're focusing on uh, Lincoln getting the 13th Amendment put into the Constitution. And I think for a lot of us, we think when we hear Emancipation Proclamation, we think, okay, slavery's over. But what was so important about getting the 13th Amendment through? Well, Lincoln was always worried. And, and to, to backtrack a bit, remember when Donald Trump was president, he issued a bunch, hundreds of executive orders. Yeah. When Joe Biden came in, he issued executive orders canceling those executive orders. Uh, actually, as we're taping today, uh, Joe Biden is signing an executive order about ghost guns. Maybe the next president will undo the executive order about ghost guns. It's not a way to make anything permanent. And Lincoln was always worried that if he lost the election or if something happened to him, or if the Supreme Court intervened, and the Supreme Court um, you know, only lost its chief justice, its, its racist chief justice, in October of 1864. Hmm. Um, so Lincoln was always worried that the court could overturn all of this, the income tax, the draft, the Emancipation Proclamation as an overreach of executive authority. So he thought, as did the Republican Party, that the way to enshrine, enshrine emancipation permanently was through a constitutional amendment, which by the way would apply not only to the states that had been identified as targets of the proclamation because they were at war against the Union, but would it involve Maryland and Delaware and Missouri and Kentucky and Tennessee, states who are in and out of Union control? Um, it would apply everywhere. And I think that was good logical thinking. But yes, the emancipation absolutely, definitely started the ball rolling and opened the gates of freedom but I'm glad the movie identified Lincoln with the 13th Amendment because it wasn't just Congress or the states. The president pushed it really hard in the House of Representatives. Had he waited? Because some said, just wait, because you know the war is over and then slavery will just die away. Instead, he died, and the amendment didn't become official until you know for seven more months. Hmm. So we talked about earlier that like the political climate then was pretty divisive, like it is now, it seems like. Um, he did something, he, within his cabinet, he brought in his rivals to sit with him. 
And what was his thinking behind that? And what can we learn to today with what he did? So I'm going to push back against that theory, even yep. though I love, I love Doris Carnes Goodwin and we're friends. And um, I don't think it was that unusual to bring in quote rivals. For, yeah. um, um, it was actually a tradition that if the leading light of the party did not win the nomination, then he would become secretary of state. Henry Clay became Secretary of State after losing the nomination uh, for president. Um, so that part of it was, you know, not unusual. And remember, they weren't, I don't, I, I'm not sure they were really rivals for the nomination in 1860. They were fellow aspirants for the nomination, but there were no debates. There was no campaigning, you know, no advertising campaigns, no negative advertising. They all wanted to be nominees. They didn't do anything about it. Their people did. And, you know, it happened very fast. It was May 1860. Uh, so Lincoln's theory of cabinet making, today it's um, usually based on gender, uh, now sexual orientation, with the first gay member of the cabinet, and men and women. Oh, I said that already, gender. Um, then it was based on region. Uh, and in Lincoln's, so he needed an Ohio and he needed a Pennsylvania, he needed a New Yorker, all the big states that had voted for him. Some people said, why don't you have someone from Illinois? And he said, I'm, I'm representing Illinois. <laughs> I don't need anybody else. Yeah. So his people, his people were, pretty, were pretty disappointed. So it was a whole different set of, of circumstances. But, um, you know, with Biden installed... Um, you know, one quote rival and really was a rival as his vice presidential candidate. Pete Buttigieg ran against him. He became secretary of transportation. So it has happened in the past. And, and um, it's probably a good thing. When did, like you mentioned, the secretary of state, it was the guy that didn't win. When did that yeah. become the president appoints it? Sorry, what was the question? When did they, when did he, when did it become that the president appointed secretary of state and it just wasn't assumed the second guy would get it? Oh, it, well, it, I guess, you know, when Washington chose Jefferson as the secretary of state, a leader of another faction of the country yeah. who didn't believe in what Washington believed in, you know, Washington believed in federalism and, and a, a foreign policy that tilted toward England and Jefferson believed in state rights and uh, and a policy that tilted toward France. And yet Jefferson became the Secretary of State because he represented a big chunk of the people. That really, but I that think really it, needed, yeah. Yeah, I think it really was in the mid 19th century when, and again, it's usually the same party. Um, when Henry Clay, who loses every time he wants to run for president, and then if he gets the nomination, he loses the election, he's named Secretary of State. So it happened a few times. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay, so to finish up, what are some myths that, uh, some unknown facts maybe about Lincoln that we would be surprised about? Um, well, I think the myth of his being a great partner uh, is a little bit exaggerated. I think he issued a lot of pardons, oh, but there were also um, executions of soldiers who left their posts, even sleeping Sentinels were executed. Wow. He didn't always intervene. Um, and the most famous case is the one that's really haunting him right now. And that's the Dakota uprising of 1862, in which more than 300 um, Native Americans were condemned to die. And um, Lincoln reviewed every case personally, but he allowed 38 to be executed. And it was the biggest mass execution in American history. Oh, wow. So should he be forgiven for the 320 he pardoned or condemned for the 338? You know, you have to go back and say, well, let, was the Indian War justified? Was it not justified? Whose land? Anyway, his statues are being defaced on the anniversary of the, that hanging all over the Northwest and in Bennington, Vermont and in San Francisco. You see big orange 38s on Lincoln statues. So I think the myth of the partner is a little exaggerated. The myth of modesty, I think, 
is exaggerated. I think, again, he was a very self-confident person who struck some people as arrogant because he, he knew what he knew. Um, but, you know, all of the other myths are pretty well-grounded. Yes, he was subject to melancholy. Yes, he had a great sense of humor. Yes, he was stronger than the people of his own time. Um, yes, he was really homely, even though some of the photographs suggest otherwise. He had, you know, really bad skin and, um, 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 you know, an awkwardness about him. So, I don't know. I'm not a myth breaker so much as a myth explainer. <laughs> yeah. So, you are talking to us today from a little piece of history. Tell us where you are. Okay. I'm happy to. So, I work at uh, Hunter College in an institute called the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. And it occupies the New York City home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and his mother. <laughs> uh, she built it as a Christmas present for them in 1901. It's on East 65th Street on the Upper East Side. Um, they lived here uh, until the day that um, he left for the presidency. He returned a few times during his presidency. And when his mother died here in 1941, FDR sold it to Hunter College at a very cheap discounted rate. Um, and it's, you know, it deteriorated for a while and then it was um, re repurposed and rehabilitated into a, an undergraduate public policy and human rights um, institute. So I'm, my office is in what was FDR's mother's bedroom. <laughs> That's so, crazy. Um, this is, I'm just going to tilt. I wonder if I could do this. I tilt this a little bit. So yeah. there you see oh. Mrs. Roosevelt. You see what a mess I have. You see Mrs. <laughs> Roosevelt's original fireplace. Wow. Where I keep boxes of my books. It's almost, it's terrible to say that. <laughs> this, this bust of Roosevelt was just delivered here from the collection of um, our late board member, William Vanden Heuvel, who was, as a teenager, hitchhiked to FDR's funeral in Hyde Park what? and then became a lifelong Roosevelt aficionado. So he passed away a couple of years ago and his daughter, uh, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, who was a pretty well-known editor, um, sent that to Roosevelt House. It's just gonna sit here for a few days while I can worship at the shrine. <laughs> uh, and then I'll put it on public view. The most important thing I can say about this house is and it's not a big house. It's not a gigantic room, as you can see. It's a town home. Um, two floors below is Roosevelt's library. And he used that as his transition headquarters. One really small room, not Trump Tower, just one room. And in that one room, all of the foundational building blocks of the New Deal um, were constructed. And uh, one day, um, his incoming Secretary of Labor, first woman in the cabinet, Frances Perkins, came into the, that room and, and Roosevelt said, I want to make you the first woman in the cabinet. And she said, I'll do it, Governor. He was Governor of New York still. Only if you agree to do old age pensions uh, on a federal level, as we began to do in New York. And he said, Okay, you know, we never said no to anybody at the um, So this is the house where Social Security was born. Wow. wow, that's wild. So you're immersed in history all day, every day. <laughs> all day, every day, and also yeah. students. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is a very vibrant house, but I like to keep the history oh, part focused. And we have yeah. a wonderful Roosevelt collection. Yes. And a, you know, great memory of FDR. Well, and I love that we got to talk about Lincoln. I think when, when we dig into these people, we realize... They're a lot more complicated than than we are taught or that we realize. And you can't, it's hard to just make simple assumptions about all of our presidents because there's so much going on and there there's a depth of character to them that we don't know. I'll tell you something that ties Lincoln and Roosevelt together. They both had, in Lincoln's case, it was not, it was his stepmother. They both had mothers who absolutely adored them and worship them and encourage them. Um, I mean, FDR's mother was just, you know, all over everything he did, um, which did not stop him from being a ladies' man and being uh, <laughs> independent when he wanted to be. 
and and Lincoln had his stepmother fighting for him. Mm. Um, uh, I it, it's interesting. Parental um, support is is a common thing you see in the, in these people. Yeah. Of course, George Washington had a horrible mother, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> okay, you okay, you teased this. What was so bad about George's mom? Well, according to Ron Chernow, uh, she was just incredibly selfish, money grubbing, and and put him down all the time. Oh, wow. Wow. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? So I guess you're gonna have the opposite reaction. You either have to be a doting mother or a really bad mother to <laughs> yeah. produce a, a terrific son or daughter. Yeah, there you go. I, yeah. yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you so much for spending time with us today, Harold, talking to us. We know you have a busy schedule and you've got to get some selfies in with that statue behind you before it leaves your office. <laughs> so I do. I have to do that. <laughs> take some selfies. And we just appreciate you and your wisdom, your knowledge. It's been a pleasure. We just thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Harold. Have a good day. Scott, that was amazing. It was. I love Harold. I would like to know why my mother-in-law never built me a house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't speak for her. I mean, we're, that's we'll just pretty never cool. Know. That's yeah. so cool where he gets the office out We're of talking about Roosevelt's day. house? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. And also, I work in an old house. I wonder who used to live there. I don't know. You're going to have to find that out. So crazy. Could be a past president. Could be. Probably not. Probably not. not. From not. I don't think there's any president from Burleson. I'm pretty sure about Probably that. Probably not. No. Yeah. There's one from Denison. Maybe the past mayor of Burleson. Okay. Here's, we're going to do a little trivia for oh, you. Oh, no. Presidential I thought, I trivia. I was getting out of it this time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is this much of history, so I have to give you something. Okay. Just one question. Okay. On the way to Denison. Who is that? There's a president that was from Denison. He became a general. He was very popular during the World War Lyndon II. Lyndon B. Johnson. No. Mm. Oh, wait. And there's, a, hold on. I'm giving you one more clue. Okay. When we're driving up. I know, it's a big giant bust of him over a to the big, side. A big giant white head. I know, I know, I know. That Jake and I had. Eisenhower. No. Oh, yeah, you got it. Ah! <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Look at you. <sighs> out of nowhere, on the spur of the moment. I, I don't know that as history. I know that because I've driven past it. But you connected <sighs> that with history. That's right. So it's one of the presidents that was from Texas. There you go. Lyndon B. Johnson Wait, is from Texas, too. I don't too. think he wasn't from Texas. Wasn't he from somewhere else? And they, then he, I think he was born in Denison. Oh, okay. But then, then he, he grew he up went, somewhere he else. He went somewhere else. Yeah. But you are right. Johnson was from Texas, too. It's just not the one I was thinking about. So you got both of them well, right. When you, you said World War II, I was like, I don't think Johnson had anything to do with World You got II. two right on the spur of the moment. Spur of the moment. Harold, being around Harold has really changed he you. He did make me smarter. You were right. <laughs> you were so right. I Thank you, know. Harold. <laughs> oh, gosh. But yes, it was so cool to see him. It's like a historian that's immersed in history all day. It makes sense. Right. You know, for sure. Um, and it was cool to talk about a president. I mean, most a lot consider him the best president, mm -hmm. like the top. But it's also neat to talk to someone like Harold that studied him and you know not everything was positive. Right. So it kind of reminds you that all of our leaders are complicated people mm -hmm. and they're dealing with really complicated issues. Yeah. So it's so easy to kind of like demonize whoever the leader is at the time. Yeah. When you don't understand everything they're going through. It's a lot going on. Yeah. Right. It's not a job I would want. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Really? No. I know a lot of people that vote for you. Oh, I yeah. believe I voted for you in past elections. Oh, yeah. I just write you in. Okay. I'm not going to say it's a wasted vote, but it's a wasted vote. <laughs> <laughs> no vote is wasted, but that one is. <laughs> really noted. Yeah. So good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. Well, we hope you enjoyed this edition of This Month in History. Awesome. We had so much fun. Party, party, five and a half over and out. We'll see you next time.